Hello and welcome back to our class on algorithmic game theory. So far, we've seen a number of ways to model strategic behavior, or more precisely, we've seen equilibrium concepts, uh, which then reflect, well, what states might uh, strategic behavior lead to. But what was implicit in these considerations so far was that strategic behavior is somehow bad for society. And this is something that we will talk about today and which we'll actually try to quantify using the so-called price of anarchy. So we will be talking about the social cost of equilibria. What is this, the social cost? Well, there are multiple ways to define social cost. The notion that we will be using today is the following. The social cost of a state S, we simply write as the sum of costs incurred by all players. Maybe you might also want to take the maximum uh, of all costs incurred by players. That, well, that's actually up to you. Uh, what you actually think, what reflects best the, uh, the notion of social cost for your current situation. But for today, let's just take the perspective that all we care about is minimizing the sum of the costs of all players. Now, as we've seen so far, the, the social cost might not be minimal in inequilibrium. And let's see this once again in a very concrete example. So we'll take a symmetric network congestion game where there's only two ways to get from S to T, namely the top edge and the bottom edge. And the delay function on the top edge um, is increasing. It is one if there's only one player using this resource, two if two players are using this resource and so on. And by the bottom edge, the delay is always four regardless of how many players use this edge. So what can happen here? Well, generally there are five kinds of states, namely um, all players might use the top edge or one player uses the bottom edge and the remaining three players use the top edge and so on. So of course matters, well, for you personally, it matters which of the players you are, but for our consideration, it doesn't actually matter. So we might now uh, write down for all of these five different kinds of states what social cost we have there. So we might have via the top edge we might have four, three, two, one or zero players. and via the bottom edge, respectively, we might have no player or one player or two players or three players or all four, four, four players using these bottom edge. What is the social cost of such a state? Well, Remember that we are now just summing up all the player's cost. What's a player's cost if all of them use the top edge? Well, if all of the four players use the top edge, then each of them has a delay of four. So this means we have four times 14, which is 16. Or if only three players use the top edge, then their delay is three times three, and we have one more player using the bottom edge, so we get another four. So this will be three times three plus four, 
This is 9 plus 4, this, this is 30. Or we'll have two players using the top edge. This means we'll have 2 times 2 plus 2 times 4. And that is 12. Or only one player using the top edge, which gives a social cost of 1, uh, plus 3 times 4, because the other three players use the bottom edge. So we'll have 1 plus 3 times 4. This is again 13. Or four players using the bottom edge. This is again 4 times 4. This is 16. Good. Um, now the question is, which of these are actually pure Nash equilibrium? Well, um, if all players use the top edge, it is actually a pure Nash equilibrium. Also, um, if three players use the top edge and one player uses the bottom edge, this is also a pure Nash equilibrium. Um, at the same time, we see, well, actually, what's best for society, namely we have only a social cost of 12, is if two players use the top edge and two players use the bottom edge. So this means, actually, due to the strategic behavior, we incur a higher social cost than if we were assigning the players to strategies. So what does this mean in a more formal way? Well, um, or in a more quantitative way, the social optimum would be 12, whereas the social cost and in equilibrium may be as high as 60. Um, so this is what we call the price of anarchy. This is the fact, uh, the, the ratio of 16 and 12, because this is the factor of how much the cost increases because we have strategic behavior. One might also define the, this ratio of 13 divided by 12. One might also consider this. This is actually um, the price of stability, which will be, which will be, we, we will be considering probably next time. Um, which is then considering the best of these equilibria compared to the optimal social cost. But as I was saying, today we are interested in the price of anarchy, and this is the worst ratio between the social cost at equilibrium and the optimal social cost. So given a cost minimization gain, we now let P and E be the set of all states that are pure Nash equilibrium. The price of anarchy for pure Nash equilibrium is defined as 
then we write P N E, sorry, we write P O A with a subscript P N E, and this is exactly equal to the maximum social cost of any pure Nash equilibrium. And this is divided by the best social cost of any state. Now we've defined the notion of the price of anarchy and let's now bound this price of anarchy for a certain class of games, which is a special class of congestion games, namely we now restrict the delay functions to be fi. And then we will be able to derive a tight bound on the price of anarchy, which means on the one hand we give an upper bound for any possible game we will bound the uh, price of anarchy and at the same time we'll give a matching lower bound by giving one particular example of a game in which the price of anarchy is actually this high. But let's first define this notion of games. We will be assuming to have non-increasing affine delay functions. This means that the delay functions are of the form dr of k is equal to ar of uh, ar times k plus br, where both ar and br are non-negative integers. So in particular, this introductory example that we had, this was of this form. Um, there we had constant functions, which are definitely affine uh, because we could just set this ar to zero, or we can just have like a linear growing function by setting this br to zero and this ar, for example, to one as we had in this, uh, in this example. Now we will bound the price of anarchy for these kinds of uh, congestion games. We will show the following theorem. In every congestion game, with affine delay functions, Price of anarchy for pure Nash equilibrium is at most. 5 divided by 2 or 2.5. So how do we prove such a theorem? Well, we will now have to consider any congestion game with affine delay functions. And in that, we will be considering any pure Nash equilibrium and we will be uh, comparing it to the social optimum. The social optimum is also a state. And what do we know about pure Nash equilibria? Well, no player can benefit from unilaterally deviating anywhere. So in particular, it is not beneficial to deviate to the social optimum, to whatever this player is doing in the social optimum. Unilaterally, 
to what this player is doing in the social optimum. Let's see this happening. So we, we let S be a pure Nash equilibrium and we let S star be a state that minimizes co uh, the social cost. What do we now know? Well, first of all, we now know that S is a pure Nash equilibrium. What does this mean? Um, well, we now have, or, so what do we now have to show? We will have to show that the social cost of S is at most the social cost of uh, 5 over 2 times the social cost of S star. Okay, now let's use the property that S is a pure Nash equilibrium. What does it mean to be a pure Nash equilibrium? Well, we've, we've seen this a couple of times now. So because S is a pure Nash equilibrium, we now have that Ci of S is at most Ci of Si star comma S minus I. This holds for all players I. So of course this player it's not beneficial to deviate to any strategy so in particular it's not beneficial to deviate to SI star. What does this give us? Well this gives us that the social cost of S will be no larger or let's first recall how it is defined that's just the sum of the costs, the player's costs. And this cannot be larger because individually we can bound each of these terms by ci of si star comma s minus i. So what we will now show is that this term here this is at most 5 over 3 times the social cost of S star plus 1 over 3 times the social cost of S. This then immediately gives us the desired bound. Why is this? Well, that's actually just playing calculus. You just subtract a third times the social cost of S from both sides of this inequality and then what you get is that two-thirds times the social cost of S is at most five-thirds times the social cost of S star, which means exactly that we're getting this bound from this. So all we have to show is that this bound here holds. So how do we show that? Well, let's recall how the how this ci of si star comma s minus i is defined. We have that ci of si star comma s minus i this is equal to take the sum over all resources 
that you're using in SI star and now add up the delay function applied on the number of players using this resource in um, uh, in the state si star comma s minus i okay well how can we now relate this to the social cost of s star and the social cost of s well first of all we can bound this here certainly by dr of nr of s plus 1. Why is this? Well, how many players can be using resource r at most in state si star comma s minus i? Well, this can be no more than however many players are using this resource in state s plus 1 because only player i actually changes his or her strategy. Good. So this means we can now write the this sum of these terms we can bound by take the sum over all players take the sum over all resources that they're using in s star respectively and now take the delay evaluated at how many players are using this resource in state s plus one now what we will do is we will swap the two sums here how does that work well this works in the pretty obvious way we might as well take the sum over all resources and now we take the sum over all players that use this resource in S star. Well, this dr term, that is actually independent of i. So we may as well just drop this as the sum over our resources and now take nr of s star times dr of nr of s plus 1. Okay, now we've at least made a step forward, namely now everything only depends on a number of players using resource in state s star and number of players using this resource in the state s so if we now simplify our notation a bit let's just write n r star instead of n r of s star and let's write n r instead of n r of s then um, if we now use that dr of k is equal to ar times k plus br. If we combine all of this, then what we're getting here is the sum of these ci of si star comma s minus i this can be no more than take the sum over all resources 
and now multiply n r star by a r times n r plus one plus b r. Okay, this is now actually already taking us pretty close to where we have to go because now all we have to do is kind of write this in terms of the social cost of, um, of S star and the social cost of S, which can be both written in a similar way. But to get there, we will need a lemma. Um, which helps us bound these quantities. But before I do this, let me first make my point. I'm now interested, we will be interested in comparing this to the social cost of S star, which is also nothing but take the sum over all resources, um, take the number of players using this resource, and then multiply this by the delay of this resource. I realize this, this is not extremely straightforward, but um, we are here again using the same kind of swapping the sums as we were using it before. So let me write this down in, for the social cost of S in a little more explicit way. How would we do that? Well, we would take the sum over all players and then sum up over all resources that this player is using and then we would sum up the delay depending on the number of players that use this resource. Now how often are we summing up the, the value of dr here? Well this is exactly for every resource we take exactly nr times the value of dr of nr here. And then we plug in the definition of dr to get exactly where we want to, where we want to get. Excellent. So, how do we relate this quantity to these two quantities? Well, we fortunately have the following lemma to our rescue. This is coming from one of the very early papers in on the price of anarchy. Although I think I've never actually seen the, the proof of this lemma written up anywhere. So I'm now presenting just my, my own proof for this. Um, It's not because this is a very complicated thing, um, but um, it is rather just some ugly calculations and some cal um, case distinctions. So for any integers y and z, we have that, oh, sorry, non-negative integers, we have that y times z plus 1 is at most 5 thirds times y squared plus a third times z squared. Okay, let's prove this. And as I was saying, it's not complicated, but it is just a kind of an ugly case distinction. So let's first consider 
the case that y is equal to 0. Well, what do we have then? Well, on the left hand side we have 0 and on the right hand side we have something non-negative, so this is indeed a trivial case. Now let's turn to the case that y is equal to 1. Well, what do we have on the left hand side then? On the left hand side uh, we have um, z plus 1 and on the right hand side we have 5 thirds plus a third times z squared. So, um, how do we get there? We use the, the, the following simple bound as z is an integer, we'll have that z plus 1, uh, z minus 1 times z minus 2 is non-negative. Why is this? Well, for z being between 0 and 1, this would be negative. But fortunately, there is no integer between 0 and 1, so this is always non-negative for any possible z that is an integer. What does this now mean? Well, we can now also write that z squared minus 3 times z plus 2, which is nothing but z minus 1 times z minus 2, this is non-negative. And what can we now do from here? Well, we can move 3 times z to the other side and then we actually get that z is at most 2 thirds plus a third times z squared. And what does this mean? Well, y times z plus 1, this is at equal to z plus 1, of course, and this is therefore at most 2 thirds plus 1 plus a third times z, uh, z squared. And this is nothing but 5 thirds times y squared plus a third times z squared. Good. Now our final case is that y is actually greater than 1. What do we have now? Well, we do a similar kind of an argument that square root of 3 fourth times y minus square root of 1 third times z, this squared is never non-negative, sorry, is always non-negative. This is um, never negative. Um, and this is equal to 3 fourths times y squared plus a third times z squared minus yz. And furthermore, we have that y is at most y squared over 2. This is because, this is the point where we're using that y is strictly greater than 1, so this wouldn't hold for y 
being equal to one, but for all otherwise, this actually does hold. So, um, what we're getting now is that y times z plus one, which is nothing but y times z plus y, this is, and let's now use the, the bound that we've just derived, 3 quarters times y squared plus a third times z squared plus a half times y squared. Just to be clear where this is coming from, uh, this year and we use to get this term here, whereas um, this year we're using to get this here. And let's now see what we have on the right hand side. Well, we have there 5 over 4, sorry, do we really have 5 over 4? No, it is actually 7 over 4 times y squared plus a third times z squared. But this is no larger than 5 thirds times y squared plus a third times z squared. And this concludes our proof of this lemma. So what does this lemma give us? This lemma now gives us that n star of a r times n r plus 1 plus b r. Well, this is nothing but a r times n r star times n r plus 1 plus b r times n r star. And here now we use that this lemma helped us bound this quantity. Um, let's again recall the lemma. The lemma was saying, okay, y times z plus 1 is at most 5 thirds times y squared plus a third times z squared. So this here is at most um, 5 thirds times nr star squared plus a third times nr squared. Good. So, where are we getting from here? Well, so overall this thing here is no more than 5 over 3 times a r times n r star squared plus a third times a r times n r squared plus b r times n r star. Now the we just upper bound this by 5 thirds times a r times n r star squared plus 5 thirds times b r times n r star plus 1 third times a r times n r squared plus 1 third times a r 
times nr. So what did we do here? Well, this here is certainly at least 1, so this is why um, this was a feasible upper bound. And also this here, this is non-negative. So that's why we, we actually increase two things and this certainly gives us an upper bound. And now we're getting to 5 thirds times a r of n r star plus b r all of this times n r star plus a third times a r times n r plus b r and all of this times n r. Good. And what does this all help us? Well, let's go back to what we actually wanted to show. We wanted to bound this quantity here in terms of these two quantities. And now what we've already done is just do this for every r individually. And so the only thing that we now have to do is take the sum over all r. So where are we? We now have that the, um, the sum of these weird terms, we knew, we knew that this was at most taking the sum over all resources um, of these. And now let me go back to what we've just shown. Um, we've now, we now actually do have an upper bound for this uh, thing on the right hand side. Namely, we now know that we can here just take the sum over all resources and we can add up 5 thirds times a r of n r star plus b r all this multiplied by n r star plus a third times a r times n r plus b r and this again by multiplied by n r and now we can just recognize that this is actually equal to five thirds times the social cost of s star plus one third times the social cost of s. And this is exactly what we wanted to show. Because now, once again, recall how this argument was working. We were already seeing that the social cost of s is at most this much. And then from uh, we see that this much here, this um, this interesting entangled sum, this is uh, upper bounded again by 5 thirds times the social cost of S star plus a third times the social cost of S. And if you now do the math, you will get exactly that the social cost of S is at most 5, third, uh, five over 2 times the social cost of S, which is exactly what we were claiming. Okay, now we know that for every congestion game with affine delay functions, the price of anarchy is no larger than 5 over 2. But is this actually the best thing that we can do, the best guarantee that we can show here? Well, yes it is. There is an example of a congestion game 
for which the price of an anarchy is actually this high. And let's see this. We will show the theorem which states that there are congestion games with affine delay functions whose price of anarchy for pure Nash equilibria is 5 over 2. We'll actually only go through a proof sketch at this point and we'll not go through all of the proof details because once again this has a tendency to get ugly for example, because we would actually have to verify that we are um, in a pure Nash equilibrium. So how does this work? Well, we will have the following asymmetric network congestion game. And here this notation x means that um, dr of x is equal to x. This means nothing but dr of x is equal to x, whereas this other notation means that dr of x is equal to 0. And this is always for all x. Now we will have four players. And these players want to get from different sources to different sinks. We have player one who wants to get from U to V. Then we'll have player 2 who wants to get from U to W. Then we'll also have player 3 who wants to get from V to W. And we'll have player 4 who wants to get from W to V. Okay, cool. So what's the opt strategy? Well, the opt strategy is always directly go to your sink. Because there is always an immediate direct edge taking you to your sink. And this always comes at a cost of one because there is nobody else using this. So once again, to see this happening here, we have player one who wants to get from U to V and in the optimum, he would be the only one taking this edge. Or we have player two who wants to go from U to W and he also takes the uh, 
uh, takes the direct edge. Or we have players three and four who also want to go from V to W or vice versa. And so they can also take the direct edges. So no two players use the same edge. But now there's the thing, there is also a bad pure Nash equilibrium. And in this pure Nash equilibrium, no player uses the direct edge, but they all go, up, go via the intermediate node on the path. Because there's also always the alternative to go the other way around and let's see this. Instead of going from U to V directly via this edge, you might also go via W. This is what player one does in, in the pure Nash equilibrium. Or the same is true for player two. Instead of going directly from U to W, uh, he or she now goes via V to W. And if we now do the math, then we will see that the costs will be three, three, and two, and two. And if we now add all of this up, then what we're getting here is a 4 here and a 10 here. So what's the ratio? It's 10 over 4, which is exactly 5 over 2. Of course, we now would have to verify that this is indeed a pure Nash equilibrium. Um, but um, that's something that you can do on your own. So now we've talked a bit about the price of anarchy for pure Nash equilibria, but what about other equilibrium concepts? Well, let's now first generalize the notion of the price of anarchy to other equilibrium concepts, and then let's also bound the price of anarchy for uh, these classes of equilibrium concepts. To define the notion of the price of anarchy more generally, we have to somehow generally speak of an equilibrium concept. And as it turns out, the easiest way to do this here is to talk about probability distributions over states. Because effectively, a correlated or coarse correlated equilibrium or also a mixed Nash equilibrium is nothing but a probability distribution over the states in the game. And the only way these equilibrium concepts matter, uh, differ, is what restrictions they put on these equilibrium concepts. So to now generally define the um, uh, the price of anarchy, we now say that given a cost minimization game, we let EQ be a set of probability distributions over the states S. And for any probability distribution P, we now also generalize the social cost to be the sum, uh, to, to be the 
expected social cost. So take the probability that uh, take the sum over all states, take the probability that this state is played uh, and then multiply this with the social cost that you would get in this state. And now the price of anarchy for the equilibrium concept EQ is defined as POA subscript EQ take the worst of these probability distributions, so nothing but the worst of these um, of these equilibria, take its social cost and compare it to the social cost of the best state. You might at, at this point ask, well, wouldn't it make sense to also take a probability distribution of our states here in the denominator? And well, you could, but eventually if you want to minimize this, you might as well also take immediately the state of smallest social cost instead of taking any probability distribution because this cannot have a smaller social cost than the best social cost of any state that you will find here. So if all of your uh, all of our favorite um, uh, equilibrium concepts exists, we can now also write that well the um, price of anarchy, the pure Nash equilibria. This is always at least one, of course, but it is uh, at most. The price of anarchy for pure Nash, uh, sorry, for, for mixed Nash equilibria, um, because also uh, any pure Nash equilibrium is a mixed Nash equilibrium. So this means the worst social welfare that you will see for a mixed Nash equilibrium can only be worse than the worst social welfare for pure Nash equilibrium, because every pure Nash equilibrium is also a mixed Nash equilibrium. You're taking the maximum only over a larger set. And similarly, because every mixed Nash equilibrium is also a correlated equilibrium, and every correlated equilibrium is also a coarse correlated equilibrium, this might be get worse and worse. But does this actually happen? That the price of anarchy is worse for, say, a mixed Nash equilibrium? Then for a pure Nash equilibrium, well, yes, this can actually happen. And let, let me give you a quick example of how this can happen. I hope you remember this game Chicken, where we had the choice of either stopping or crossing the intersection. Well, if both players choose to cross the intersection, then they will have an extremely high cost. But um, if they both stop, it's okay, but if the other player stops, then you would actually rather cross the intersection. So this game will look like this. This is the bimatrix game. Now, um, what are the pure Nash equilibria here? Well, there are two pure Nash equilibria, namely one of the player stops the other player crosses the intersection.
So that will be cross and stop and stop and cross. What's the social cost of these? Well, the social cost will be one. But there is also a mixed Nash equilibrium. By the way, that the cost is one, that the social cost is one in both pure Nash equilibria, this immediately means that the price of anarchy for pure Nash equilibria is also one because those are actually social optima. But there is a further mixed Nash equilibrium. Uh, which is uh, cross with probability one over a hundred and stop otherwise. What's the social welfare of this? Well, with probability one over a hundred times one over hundred, both players actually cross. And then we'll have a social cost of a hundred plus a hundred. Okay, that's actually the accident situation. Then, with probability, two times a hundred times 99 over a hundred, one of the players stops, the other crosses. And then, with the probability of 99 over 100 times 99 over 100, both players actually stop and will have a social cost of 1. So if you do the math here, then you will see that this sums up to 1.9801. And this means that the price of anarchy for pure Nash, uh, for mixed Nash equilibria is actually 1.9801 because uh, this is um, the worst mixed Nash equilibrium because as we've seen, um, or maybe, uh, there are no further mixed Nash equilibria for the simple reason that we've now enumer enumerated the entire su possible support for mixed Nash equilibria. So these are all three mixed Nash equilibria that exist in this game, and this one has to be the worst. Good, so this means, well, in this game, the price of anarchy for pure Nash equilibria is actually one, whereas the price of um, anarchy for mixed Nash equilibria is almost two. But how can we in general bound the price of anarchy for other equilibrium concepts more general than pure Nash equilibria? As a matter of fact, the technique that we used before to bound the price of anarchy for pure Nash equilibria generalizes. And this is what we will do next. So now we want to generalize the technique that we use to bound the price of anarchy for pure Nash equilibria in congestion games with affine delay functions to more general equilibrium concepts. And as a matter of fact, this generalizes in a very nice way. We've shown in our proof, although we didn't call it this way back then, that this was a smooth game. What's the definition of a smooth game? A game is called lambda comma mu smooth for lambda greater than zero and mu being smaller than one
if for every pair of states s and s star we have the sum of the ci of si star comma s minus i is at most lambda times the social cost of s star plus u times the social cost of s I hope this looks familiar because this is exactly what we were bounding in our um, in our pr uh, proof for bounding the pure uh, the price of anarchy for pure Nash equilibrium um, in these congestion cases with affine delay functions. But this is a little more general because. Um, back then in our proof, we were assuming that S was a pure natural equilibrium, S star was, was a social optimum. This all doesn't show up in this definition. We were um, these uh, states and S, S and S star, those uh, just have to be arbitrary states. So this has to hold for any an arbitrary pair of states and S and S star. And if this is true, then the game is called smooth. Um, but let's quickly see that we actually, let's quickly verify that we actually proved this thing. Because I claim that we already proved that every congestion game with affine delay functions um, is five thirds comma one third smooth. Let's quickly go back to our proof of how we, we showed this. Well, we took, as I was saying, S to be a pure natural equilibrium, S star to be a state that minimizes social cost. And then we said, okay, because S is a pure natural equilibrium, um, this of course does not hold in general for any pair of states. But then from this point onward, we only showed that this sum here uh, of these um, ci of si star comma s minus i is bounded by five thirds times the social cost of s star plus one third times the social cost of s. And if you now go through the proof, well, you will see a lot of calculations happening, but you will what you will never see is that we argue, well, this is happening because, well, either this is a social optimum or because uh, this is a pure natural equilibrium. This doesn't appear anywhere in here. So we've actually already shown this theorem that I was claiming now that Every congestion game with affine delay functions is five thirds, comma one third smooth. Now the thing is, this smoothness already implies a bound on the price of anarchy for pure Nash equilibrium. And let's quickly recap why this is true. We took S to be a pure Nash equilibrium.
and we took S star to be the social optimum or a social optimum. And then we saw, well, the social cost of the social cost of S. This can be bounded by, well, no player wants to unilaterally deviate to whatever he or she does in S star, and then we can apply smoothness. Now, subtracting on both sides, Um, this mu times the social cost of S, this gives us that 1 minus mu times the social cost of S is no larger than lambda times the social cost of S star. And this means nothing but that the social cost of S divided by the social cost of S star is no more than lambda over 1 minus mu. But the nice thing is we can immediately generalize this proof. We can now show that In a lambda comma mu smooth game, the price of anarchy for coarse correlated equilibria is at most lambda over 1 minus mu. And this, by the way, was exactly the kind of a guarantee uh, that we were also showing before. But before, we were only showing this for pure Nash equilibrium. So this has to be a tiny bit more difficult now, because this is a more general proof. But um, it actually works exactly the same way. Um, so we now let P be a coarse correlated equilibrium and S star still be a social optimum. What's now the social cost of P? Well, as I was saying, we're taking actually the expectation, draw a state from P, and now consider the social cost and the expected social cost that you're getting. So, how much is that? Well, what is the social cost of the state? Um, it is the sum of the individual player's cost. Now, what we can do is we can move this sum over all players also outside this expectation by linearity of expectation. And now, for every player, we use the property that this player is happy with whatever the course correlated equilibrium recommends. This means that this here is still bounded by, okay, course correlated equilibrium still may recommend something, but I'm unilaterally moving to always playing as I star. 
So, we'll have still the sum of these expectations, which I hope now look a lot familiar. Now what we can do is we can actually move again the sum inside the expectation, once again using linearity of expectation. And now we can apply smoothness. Because what's ever happening here inside the expectation, it doesn't have to do anything with our equilibrium concept. That's just, well, there is some s, there is some s star. Well, actually, s is now a random variable. But what do we care? We can always say, okay, this is at the most lambda times the social cost of s star plus mu times the social cost of s. So, because this holds point-wise, regardless of what s is, although it is a random variable, we can replace this inside the expectation. And now we use linearity of expectation once again. This, the social cost of s star, for example, doesn't depend on s, so that's not a random variable, that's just a constant in terms of the expectation. Also, this mu is a constant. And this, once again, is nothing but the social cost of our equilibrium. So where are we now? Well, the social cost of the equilibrium is bounded by lambda times the, the optimal social cost plus mu times the social cost of the equilibrium. So this means that 1 minus mu times the social cost of the equilibrium is no more than lambda times the social cost of s star, or in other words, the um, social cost of the equilibrium divided by the optimal social cost is at most lambda over 1 minus mu. Good. So, this means now that the price of anarchy for coarse correlated equilibria is at most lambda over 1 minus mu. And as we've seen before, this also will give us a price of anarchy bound for correlated equilibria or for mixed Nash equilibria or for pure Nash equilibria. And as a matter of fact, we've seen an example where all of these are equalities because we showed that for our class of congestion games with affine delay functions, um, the uh, we, this, we, we showed this upper bound via smoothness, we actually showed that this lambda over 1 minus mu, this is exactly 5 over 2, but we also gave an example that there are gains in which this can be as large as 5 over 2. So, this is generally the answer for all these equilibrium concepts. For general congestion games with affine delay functions, the best price of anarchy for all these equilibrium concepts that you can show is 5 over 2.
Good. So this completes our discussion of the price of anarchy, although the price of anarchy will actually come back later in this class, also in a different context, and also the notion of smoothness will come back. Um, but before that, um, we will, for example, still ask the question, what if we are less pessimistic about the equilibria? Uh, what if we consider the question of what is the best equilibrium that we can hope for? Uh, that, that, that there is. So, because, well, that's at least how much we definitely have to lose due to strategic behavior. This is then called so-called the price of stability, um, for which one actually applies different techniques, which we will see later. Thank you very much for your time uh, today, and please do let me know if you have any questions.